So we stopped on this uh, statement on this uh, history with you from John 2021. 20, the importance of this is what we've been explaining earlier on, earlier today. Because that uh, you cannot separate the interior understanding, the deepest understanding of peace from forgiveness of sins. Okay? So, Jesus Christ knows that he came for us to be reconciled with God. And that he knows that he is basically returning to the Father to send us his basically new presence, his universal presence. And in that presence, he will minister to us in word and sacrament. And so he institutes the sacrament of reconciliation after he rose from the dead. And this is the text. I want you to listen to this very attentively. Okay? Especially for Catholics who say, well, I don't need to go to confession to a priest, I go to my God directly. I always say, your God will send you back to where he told you to go. Mm. So this is what he says. We are John 20, chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, where is that first day of the week? On the, on Sunday. What you call Sunday. When the doors were locked, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Okay? When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Now the, it's living proof that the one who was crucified has risen from the dead. We saw his wounds, okay? Jesus said to them again, listen to this, again, peace be with you. And as he said, uh, when he said this, as the Father sent me, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Peace be with you. Now this is like a heightened sense of giving this peace. Okay? Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. There, the meaning is that now you are basically me. You have the same authority as I have. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. He breathed on them. The Hebrews call that breath, roha. Roha. In the Greek pneuma, okay? But roha, okay? The breath, okay? Roha, okay? That roha is the life of God. It is the love of God. It is the power of God. That Ruha is the one we call the Holy Spirit. So, and when I have said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive power. Okay? That's what it is. Receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Remember, he is going to give them the Holy Spirit. He has even given them the Holy Spirit in different instances when he instituted the Eucharist at Pentecost. This is not Pentecost. This Spirit is specifically given for a particular power. Okay? This is not a general power. This is specific power. Receive the Holy Spirit for a purpose. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Jesus doesn't say, whose sins I forgive. Because as the Father sent me, so I send you. So whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. So Martin Luther, being somehow spiritual delusional, he said that he will hear it among, a, among Protestants, because they don't believe in the sacrament of confession. They say that Catholics are stupid because baptism is the same as confession, so you didn't need to go to confession. Baptism forgives your sins and whatever. Then you ask them, have you ever seen the sins of your baptism? 
Have you ever committed a sin since your baptism? So they say, yes. So what do you do with those sins? What do you do with them? They go to that direction. <laughs> so, so Luther would interpret this as many Protestants they would say that what Jesus here was not actually giving them power to forgive sins, was giving them power to preach the gospel. Where does it say that he's giving them power to preach the gospel? In this text. It's a lie, it doesn't say. Jesus gave them the power to preach the gospel in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. As the Father sent me, so I send you, go and teach all nations, baptizing them. Teach them to observe all I have commanded you. So this is where Jesus institutes the sacrament of penance or reconciliation. But we see peace. Peace be with you. This sacrament is to restore peace to broken hearts. Because sin breaks us. Sin scatters us. And the peace of Christ in this sacrament makes us whole. <clears throat> so, the reason again that there is not peace, especially in our church, is because almost 80% of Catholics don't go to confession. So where do we get our peace if we don't receive it from peace himself? In the very sacrament he instituted for our peace. He instituted for our peace. And we say that I would find my peace otherwise. Not as the word gives peace do I do. This is how he gives peace. But whoever wants peace does this, obeys this command. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, you don't forgive are not forgiven. Okay? So we have to take that very seriously if we want peace. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing the reason Lord says to his disciples is, disciples is, peace be with you. St. Paul explores this mystery and it tells us that Christ is our peace. He who made both one and broke down the dividing wall of enmity through his flesh, abolishing the law with its commandments and legal claims, that he might create in himself one new person in place of the two. This establishing peace and might reconcile both with God in one body through the cross, putting that enmity to death by it. He came and he preached in peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. That's Ephesians 2, 14, 16. Also, for, that's, this is Galatians, for in him all the fullness was placed to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things for him, making peace, making peace, Colossians, making peace by the blood of his cross, through him, whether those on earth or those in heaven. <clears throat> How did God make peace? By the blood of his cross, by the sacrifice of the cross. What does the sacrifice of the cross do? What does that sacrifice do? Okay. Let's, uh, let's pray together the words of consecration of the cup. After supper, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing. And he gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many so what is the purpose of the cross to forgive sins and what is the goal of forgiving sins to establish peace between us and our God and our neighbor 
That is how we achieve peace through forgiveness of sins. That's how he established the peace by the blood of, of his cross. And now he tells us how his blood is poured upon us to wash away our sins so that our souls, our being is ennobled, is elevated. He tells us how his blood comes to us to make us clean. He tells us how his blood is poured into us. His blood is mercy. And he tells us it is the sacrament of reconciliation. So that's what he told his sister Faustina in her diary. I think it's Article 6, what? 6 20 something. Mm -hmm. That every time someone comes to confession, receive the sacrament of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. My blood, the blood that gushed from my son, okay, gushes into their soul and it cleanses it of sin and it elevates it and ennobles it. But he, he's telling us like, in, in scripture. Okay? So those prophetic signs in apparitions are simply confirmation of what? Divine revelation text. <coughs> so, please, at least we shouldn't spend a year without going to confession. At least as the church says. Because that's how peace is established between me and my God and my being. The church. Okay? Yes. Now, how often should you go to confession? I think when we are done with this uh, class, I think it will be maybe still late, I don't know, maybe after. The next is sacrament, I think we need to look at briefly the sacrament of reconciliation. That's what we need. So, as often as something grave weighs on my conscience. If I went to confession today, and I happen to commit a mother's sin tomorrow, I go to confession. Okay. Whenever a grave sin weighs on our conscience. Okay. Now, we are told specifically that every mother's sin should be taken to confession. And the church highly recommends that venial sins too be taken to confession. Now, venial sins may be forgiven through Mercy. prayer, Mercy. sacrifice, and charity. Okay? Of course, I take a video at mass. Okay? But as you know, in your sins, they drop, they drop, they drop, it fills the bucket. That's how we fall into moral sins. So we must take in your sins very seriously. How is it just a in your sin? Sometimes we ask, how do you know? <laughs> So, as we ready ourselves to receive his body and the blood, okay, meaning that we're going to unite ourselves to and with the sacrifice of reconciliation. The sacrifice of the cross, which was offered for the forgiveness of my sins, our sins. So as we ready ourselves to receive the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, we address ourselves directly to him and recalling the peace he once promised, ask him for this same peace in our present and in our future. Why do we believe that he's going to give us that peace? Because he said he would. Because that it is his way. That's what he wants. That's what he desires that we have that peace. So we dare to ask him because we know it is his will that we receive. Okay? So just help me, God, to have the right, proper disposition to receive that peace because I know that's what he wants to give me. To give to me. Okay? So a priest says, the Lord Jesus, who said you, you are apostles, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said you are apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins. Meaning, wipe them away. Doesn't mean just ignore them. No, that's not what we are saying. 
Okay? Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. Now that statement is very profound. Okay? The faith of your church. What is the faith of this church? The faith of this church is far much broader, broader than me as an individual. St. Thomas Aquinas makes this distinction between Fides Que and Fides Qua. Fides Qua and Fides Que. So, there is the objective content of the faith of the church. It's objective, it is true, whether I believe it or not. If I say, Jesus didn't exist, that doesn't remove the fact that he did exist. If I say Jesus didn't, didn't die on the cross, that doesn't raise the fact that he died on the cross. Okay? That is the objective content of the faith. So that objective content of the faith must be become, I must appropriate it to become my own. So the objective is personalized so that my personal faith is the faith of the church. There is no difference between the objective and the subjective, the person. What I believe is what the church believes. Now, this church has believed, and all the members of the church have believed the same truth. Because truth is one, and the truth does not change. Okay? Truth is one, and the truth does not change. So all the members of the body of Jesus Christ have been called to believe in the same thing. Now when we say, do not look on my sins, our <coughs> sins, okay, but on the faith of your church, what I'm really telling Jesus is, Jesus, I'm weak. No. <laughs> I waver. But look at the faith of your life. Because Mary lived by faith in this world. And she fully participated in the faith of the church as the preeminent prophet to believe. So when you tell him to look at the faith of his church, that's what we are saying. <coughs> but not beginning even with Mary. Mary is a descendant of Abraham, our father in faith. So this is what we are basically addressing to God. The faith of the apostles, the faith of the saints through the centuries. This is what we are saying. Okay? Look on the faith of your church. Okay? And the gracious late. That word gracious is you know, very important. Grace is gift. Okay? So God gives his gifts in abundance. The Hebrews call it a saint. Said, graciousness. So God is gracious, meaning He gives gifts in abundance. That's why Jesus made abundant wine at Cana. That's why He multiplied loaves okay, as a sign of abundance. Okay? The messianic abundance. When the Messiah comes, there will be abundance of bread and wine. But the real abundance is the Eucharist which is life eternal. It can't be exhausted. And that abundance is not something the Messiah gives, but it is He Himself, body and blood. So graciously grant her peace, your church, graciously in abundance, okay? grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. For you live and reign for ever and ever. And the people respond, Amen. 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 We say Amen, but it's Amen. It's amen. 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 In English, we twist everything. And in many languages, that's what we do. If it's not your language, you twist it. You get to fit your language. Amen. Then the priest the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. 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 Okay. <clears throat> and then we say, let us offer each other. Okay. And then we go. And then we go. That's why we are going to look at this document. Because it explains everything. 
How many of you don't, don't have this yet? Right. Mm -hmm. David probably will print us copies next week. <laughs> Father, can you this, explain this time? That's the PP That's what the sign of the right? In the US, the norm is to. Yes. Because, you know, there is a. The, the Holy See, the Apostolic See, Rome, allows for episcopal conferences okay, to determine how this sign of peace is given, depending on cultural circumstances. But again, that has to be also approved by law. Okay? But the Episcopal conferences can decide on that. Okay? As we will say. But you give peace to the person next to you. Not. <laughs> That's why sometimes you know, some priests want even to, to just go on and don't, don't say, give each other. Because it becomes a circus. It's a distraction. Mm -hmm. So, but we might, it's a very important time, so there must be no catechesis. Okay, so the priest greets the assembly, we're explaining this now. The priest greets the assembly with the very words of our risen God. By the way, mm, as we said before, there are some books we need to have. In this one, Father Jeremy, here. some of these things are from here. This book is very important. And also, I will ask you to, some of you have this book already. Yeah. <laughs> the Eucharistic Meditations of St. John Melvier. It's very, very important to study this man. At least what he says about the Eucharist. Because he was a very, very holy man who understood the mystery and his advice is always very good. Okay? Yes. So the priest agrees the assembly with the very words of our risen Lord. The members of the assembly turn to those immediately near them and they offer the same greeting of the risen Lord. This is a ritual exchange, not a practical greeting. It's not high. Um, no, it's a ritual greeting. Okay? It's a ritual exchange. Peace be with you is a gesture which signifies our love for one another in Jesus Christ. It's not a cultural high. It's not a cultural howdy. It is an embrace. And embrace. Usually we say the, the kiss of peace or whatever. But in the Hebrew culture, it's an embrace. You embrace someone. Okay? It's a, a sign of acceptance that you accept the other into your life. That there is no enmity. You are at peace with them. It's an embrace, a dimension of communion. Our being joined together as one body in Christ. The very one we are all going to partake of. And then we sing, we are one body. But you can't even look at your neighbor because you don't know. In the same assembly, we are one body. <laughs> we who have just said together to God, our Father, in the Our Father, okay? In consequence, now turn to one another and say, brother, sister. Because the vertical dimension has horizontal consequence. We cannot love God and ignore our neighbor. St. Teresa, I think St. Teresa of Avila, she put it so well, that we may not be sure of our love of God. Do you love God? Show me. Ah. Do you love God? Are you sure? How sure are you? How sure are you that you love God? Seriously. How sure are you that you love God? Are you sure that you love God? So St. Teresa of Avila says, we may not be sure that we really love God. 
Okay? We may not be sure. But I can be sure that I love you or I hate you. That much I can be sure of. Okay? My neighbor I see. I can be sure that I love you or that I don't love you. So if I'm sure that I love my neighbor, then and only then am I sure that I love my God. That's the only way we can be sure of our love of God. That's the sure way to know that we love God. Because we can be sure that we love our neighbor. Or that we hate our neighbor. If we hate our neighbor, we are sure that we hate God. Okay? Well, no, but I love my God. Show me how you love him. He will tell you, I was hungry, thirsty, naked. But that was the mean neighbor. <laughs> no, that was me. Are you sure? I love my God. But those illegal, they are crossing the border. I remember one time, Patrick Madrid was a uh, wrestling with a man, a guy who called him. This man was so, uh, it, was, it was so ridiculous. Before he talked to Patrick, he basically gave the litany of his faith. I'm a credo Catholic, I go to Mass every day, I do this and this and this, this is my position on this. Then Patrick said, if that illegal person crosses the border and he is hungry at first, would you give him drink? He said, no. Why? Because they broke the law. But I'm a credit captain. I'm a daily communicant. Do you know what Jesus would tell such people? Do you know it? <laughs> Let's look at Matthew 5, what he says about those people. Those <laughs> we are in Matthew chapter 5. No, we said in chapter 1. What? No, no, 7. 7. Yes. We are in chapter 7. Again with verse. Chapter 7? Yes. Chapter 7. So, big verse 21, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Begin verse, okay? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So, simply, I was showing up to, at Mass, okay, to Mass every Sunday, or every day, praying the rosary every day, merely just doing that, okay, it's a very noble thing to do. But if we're just doing that, okay, we will not get us to heaven. So, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Okay? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? I was a priest. I preached every Sunday, right? You didn't see me? <laughs> did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty deeds in your name? Then I will declare to them solemnly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Why did he not know them? I never knew you. Why? Because you did not love, therefore you are not like me, therefore I don't know you. It's that simple. 
Jesus doesn't say which neighbors. When he says, I was hungry, thirsty, naked, he doesn't say which one. Okay? I don't know you. Because when we don't love, we are not like God, and God cannot, cannot, doesn't recognize us. God recognizes love. That's why he made us in his image, in his likeness, so that when we were good and loving, we reflect his goodness and love. That's why he loves us. Or oh, someone who heard well, but God loves you no matter what you do. Okay, tell that to the devil. Devil, God loves you no matter what you do. You're crying hell. God loves you. <laughs> I hate those sayings. They, they, they can be so misleading to people. You don't need to confront, you don't need to change, because God loves you no matter what you do. So you don't need to change, you don't need to do anything. Okay? Okay. We know that the devil's evilness doesn't diminish God's love. Okay? But God's love doesn't benefit the devil an inch in any way, because the devil will not accept that love. So if we refuse to love, we reject love, we become like the evil. Okay. And so God recognizes, the Father recognizes His Son because His Son is love. Love is obedience. Love is humility. So the Father recognizes this sacrifice of obedience, the sacrifice of humility. So if we disobey the commands of Jesus, the Father cannot recognize us in the Son. And when we pray, recognizing this sacrificial victim by whose death you will reconcile us to yourself, how am I going to be reconciled if God can't recognize me? If I reject His love. But I love God. You reject Him by rejecting your neighbor. How? Because by virtue of the incarnation, I became your neighbor. I am your neighbor. That's why I'm, I'm not saying when he was hungry, when I was hungry. But that wasn't you. I told you that I am. No excuses. Okay? So we have to take this very, very seriously. So we just prayed our father now, it is my sister, my brother. We who have just prayed, forgive us as we forgive, turn to one another with this sign of reconciliation amongst ourselves. Okay? Father Jeremy explains that in this book, page 120. Okay, this is a strong and a powerful ritual expression of the love that the members of the body of Christ must be share among themselves as the condition. We always talk about God's love and salvation. We have to remember our salvation is conditional. It's not automatic. We have to emphasize this over and over and over again because many of us misunderstand God's unconditional love. God's unconditional love involves in God committing himself to our salvation. They are called covenants of divine commitment. But once God commits himself, a creature has the obligation to respond. Not an option. An obligation to respond. I will be your God and you will be my people if you do what I command you. John 15, you are my friends if you do what I command you. So we shouldn't misunderstand God's unconditional love as licentiousness. God is not irresponsible. God is responsibility. Okay? So this uh, peace, this rich expression, the peace again, okay? The, member, the love that the members of his body share among themselves as the condition for being united with their head. It is the condition 
if we had people, my neighbor, or that particular person or a group of people, we have no business receiving Holy Communion. If we do, we are betraying Jesus with an embrace, with a kiss. As Judas did. That's what we do if we hate people. If you're not ready to reconcile with our neighbor and go to receive communion, we are kissing Jesus, betraying him with a kiss. Sometimes you say, Judas did something terrible. Well, I do. The same thing he did. If I refuse to love my neighbor. Okay? So, it, it places a sign of reconciliation and peace within the communion rite as a whole. So remember that in the beginning of Mass, we reconciled in the Confidio. Okay? So this peace right now is a sign of love and a communion, which again is an expression of the reconciliation we profess in the beginning. Okay? So we embrace one another in the peace that comes from the sacrifice offered. What is that peace that comes from the sacrifice offered? Forgiveness of sins. When our sins are forgiven, what are we supposed to do? To forgive others. Because we've just prayed in the Our Father, forgive us as we forgive. Okay? So we embrace one another in the peace that comes from the sacrifice offered, the sacrifice of reconciliation. So it would be a circus, you know, duping, trying to dupe God, if I do all these signs, but internally I harbor hatred. So hatred is a sign of not having the presence of God in me. If a person is hateful, it's a sign that there is no God in them. They may talk about God, in fact they don't know God. God says, I don't know you, I don't know where you come from, I can't recognize you. But I talk about you. And God will say nonsense. You are an evil doer. You are accursed. Okay? So, the peace that comes from the sacrifice offered, and at the same time, we are making a sign of the reality signified in the sacrament we are about to receive. We have prayed, forgive us as we forgive. And now, we make a sign of that intention before receiving our daily bread, which we pray for. When this rite is properly carried out, not like, you know, just a job, but when it's properly carried out, not allowing it to lose its ritual character and a breakdown into a sort of, a sort of chatter session, which does not make any sense at this moment, it has the potential, if it's done well, it has the potential for refusing to let those who are to receive the body and blood of our Lord to do so without realizing that the Lord who is received unites the assembly in himself as one body. Okay? As one body. You know, the, the, many of the uh, parables of Jesus, okay, all of them, are just, you know, classic theological explanations of the mystery of God. Among them is the parable of the Father's love, which we call the parable of the prodigal son. The second son hears the celebration. The prodigal child, the younger brother, is now reconciled. He went and wounded himself and did all sorts of things. He comes to the Father with a contrite heart. He is made clean. He enters the banquet hall, heaven. The second son, okay, who thinks he knows the Father, because he has been with the Father all the time, hears the banquet, the celebration, he asks, what is going on? Your brother is back. He becomes a dead He refuses to enter heaven because his brother is in heaven. I can't share heaven with my brother. Think about that. Because my brother doesn't deserve heaven. I deserve it. Because I did ABCD. 
So who is my savior now? I am my savior, my salvation, because I live in this city. That is a sin of many so-called religious people, credo Catholics. God, I do A, B, C, D. Those people are there having fun. Okay? I don't deserve to have cancer or to do whatever. Okay? I deserve only good things because I'm serving you well. So who is serving who? I am serving myself by what I do. That is called Pharisaic righteousness, which is not righteousness at all. So, we always have to keep that in mind <coughs> if we choose to reconcile with others. If God chooses to reconcile and I claim to know Him, to know the Father's heart, why can't I accept the Father's will? That that brother of mine who did whatever he did has been now reconciled and I can sit at table with Him and the Father is calling me to sit at table with Him or however that is. And I said, but, but, they did evil. I've been doing good. Really? Have you been doing good? Do you know what goodness is? What is goodness? Reconciliation. What is goodness? Peace. And God has come to bring that peace, and we reject it at the same time, thinking that we are embracing it. The way we want, not the way God wants. Wins. And that way we can't be said. Why? Because we are doing our will, not the will of God. So that's why this, you know, time is very, very important. Okay? God is uniting the same way. I must accept His will, what He is doing. So, that's it. Then, the breaking of bread. One of the most ancient names by which Christians called the Mass was the breaking of the bread. That's the biblical name for the Eucharist. Many are made one by sharing the one love, that is, the one body of Christ. With the bread being understood to be the body of Christ, it was not possible to break the bread without seeing in this ritual action an image of the Lord's body on the cross being broken, the crucifixion being broken in order to give us life, to be distributed to us. Jesus himself took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, As this takes place, the breaking of bread, we sing the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. When we get this Lamb of God, Exodus chapter 12. When the Hebrews left Egypt. That Lamb, the ate whose blood saved them from death, was prefiguring, foreshadowing, the true Lamb of God, whose blood takes away the sin of the world. John declares that in John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God. That's what we say at Mass. Okay. So, Jesus is our Passover lamb whose body has been sacrificed. Whose body has had been poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. This is the lamb that was slain who takes away sin to grant the gift of peace. As we hear in Revelation chapter 5, 11, 12. Okay. And two, and those are blessed who are called the wedding feast of the Lamb. Revelation 19, 79. Blessed are those who are called the wedding feast of the Lamb. So you see, our mass is the lengthy gospel. So everything we say is biblical. All those things we will take from divine revelation. Because mass is divine revelation. Okay. So when uh, some other people criticize us that no, mass is that uh, we do something demonic as uh, Catholics and whatever, they, they don't know what they're talking about. Yes. Going back to the peace and the ritual of explaining the peace, yes. is there a right or a wrong way of saying peace be with you? 
No, that's what he said. He's dealing with. Is there a right way of or of answering, or do we just that? Because my dad. He's been with you. He's been with you. Oh, because my dad gives us every single time. Mm -hmm. He comes to the Spanish masses, and I guess somebody explained to them that you're supposed to respond and with your spirit. And so he always says, "He's still with you, with us." And and then if we don't respond, he gets all upset about it. That's how you address it, priest. Okay. Yes. So, so we can just say peace be with you, peace, peace be, be with you. you. Be we don't have to say it with your spirit. No. Okay, that's from up for the priest to yes, say that. Yes, yes. Okay. There's reason why. Okay. So that's what we do. Okay? But this document will explain more about the technicalities we do here. Okay? So let us stop here for today. The, the morning class is way ahead, so we need a... <laughs> Well, they are way ahead in the days. Yeah. Remember some nights for us we had a confirmation from the rivers we didn't have to pass some But we were getting there. We're catching up. So we pray. Hail the Holy Queen. To be who we cry for that is children of Eve. To be who we set up our sides, morning and evening in this valley of tears. Turn to him who brings us out of the gate, and our lives of mercy towards us. And after we start our child, show us the gods and let us the root of thy own Jesus. O Lamb and all that make those who were virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, and may we be the year and give the promises of Christ.